Coming up next, you should kill your next meeting. I'm going to tell you why. And hybrid work, is it exhausting? Is it the best way? And then the best states to work from home? Crazy job titles and what they pay, and I coach you up. Welcome to the Ken Coleman Show, where we exist for one reason, to help you win at work and at home. More money, more meaning. Who doesn't want that? (laughs) I don't know. All right, let's get into this. So we're going to talk about something that is a big productivity buster. It's a soul drainer. I, I, I was thinking about that, Alex, earlier today in my show prep. I think meetings, poorly run meetings, um unnecessary meetings are productivity busters and soul drainers. I think to, I think that's what it is. I mean, if you think about it, you think about one of the biggest productivity busters, it's all the meetings. Now I'm talking about horrible meetings, horribly run, and I'm talking about unnecessary meetings. I am not banging on meetings in general. Here we go. Why you should kill your next meeting. <laughs> I love this. I've been looking forward to this content for a while. I'm, it's going to be therapeutic for me. 41% of respondents to a time is limited uh, study of 255 HR leaders within United States companies pinpointed the problems with poorly run unnecessary meetings. 41% of the respondents said... That meeting culture, that means culture is shared behavior. If you want to define the word culture easily, it's shared behaviors. All right? So a meeting culture in a company that is uh, too long, too long meetings, poorly timed meetings, and lacking focus. This is the number one killer of productivity, according to 41% of HR leaders. 67% of HR leaders strongly agreed that letting employees choose which meetings they go to would increase productivity. Now, I found this to be fascinating. If you let employees choose which meetings to go to, well, that kind of takes away the whole mandatory meetings thing. Some of you leaders that are watching and listening to this right now are breaking out in hives all over your body. Uh, Ice pack or Benadryl would be good in this moment because that's freaking some of you out. I'm not sure how I feel about that. Other than to say, it's a fun test. Shall we say a two-week test where leaders set these meetings out and they said, you choose whether or not you come to this. But the but, but this is an honor system, right? You don't just say, no, I hate meetings. I hate my job. I'm not coming. But you choose why, and you have to let us know why you're not coming. Now, that would be fascinating because now leaders are going to begin to see, Wow. My meetings aren't as relevant as I thought they were. I think that's what that exercise would point out. Now, HR leaders are saying this. So I got to tell you, it makes me a little bit uncomfortable because I'm going, how do you execute on that? What do you learn from it? But regardless of whether or not you like the idea or not, let me tell you what would shake out. People would find out pretty quick whether or not their meetings are relevant because people who want to stay employed would come to the meeting because it should inform something that they need to do. But if nobody's showing up to the meetings, well, it's pretty clear that the meeting isn't delivering anything that's practical. And that's the point. So here's the problem with a a culture of work where we have unnecessary meetings and we run meetings poorly. Here's the problem. It's killing our true productivity. Now, I understand meetings are important for communication, creative brainstorming, problem solving. I get that. But if they are unnecessary and they're poorly run, they end up hurting the organization by frustrating the team, delaying results. I mean, let's just be real here. And yet, I think we all know this. I'm not seeing anything that anybody's going, well, great point, Ken. And yet we don't do anything about it, which is why I led off with kill your next meeting. Now let's get to the solution. I literally want you to, to, to literally postpone your meetings that you've got on the books until you figure out a way to do meetings the right way, and I'm here to help. 
I'm here to help. And I'm not kidding when I say kill your meeting. No, you can reschedule it. But I'm being drastic here to say no more meetings until you figure out, is the meeting necessary? Can I solve this need for meeting with an email, a phone conversation, a quick pop by the desk? I'm serious. Is the meeting necessary? Let's start with that. If the answer is no, don't reschedule it. If the answer is yes, I've got some tips from my friends and colleagues at Entree Leadership, which is our leadership division at Ramsey Solutions. For many years, I was the host of the Entree Leadership Podcast. I still speak at our Entree Leadership events, and they have a couple of great resources for you. One, uh, they've got a leader meeting tool that is worth its weight in gold, but it will cost you a very reasonable and extremely relevant amount of money to join Entree Leadership Elite, which is their leadership coaching group. All right. Now, they also have a free solution through an article on RamseySolutions.com entitled Four Secrets to Super Productive Meetings. I'll say it again so you can look it up. It's a free read. It's a great read. I'm going to touch the highlights right now. The article is Four Secrets to Super Productive Meetings uh, by Entree Leadership. So here, here's how we reset. If we've answered the question, is my meeting necessary? If the answer is yes, here are some high-level tips to make sure that you now make it highly functional, highly effective. One, let's let everybody know that being late is not an option. Let's just set that boundary. Can't be late. We, we have a very tight agenda. Now, this will be new for a lot of folks. They'll be going, what's going on with this meeting? Use that to your advantage. Make them think it's probably way more important than it actually is, but we're now setting a new tone. We have a very tight agenda to hit, so we got to hit it show the agenda out of the gate and then stick to it. Three, keep your team engaged throughout the entire meeting, making sure everybody has a chance for input. Uh, don't go off on long lectures and tangents. Don't schedule the, these meetings super early or super late in the day. That's not a good idea. And then finally, set a time limit that is attached to that agenda. So it's not just our meeting is from 12 to 1. It's, oh, it's 12 to 1, but we got a time limit on we're discussing this for 10 minutes, we're discussing this for 15, we're going to do this for 10, and we wrap with five minutes on this. This is the kind of discipline and focus that should make a necessary meeting highly effective. So what's the reason for this solution? Obviously, greater engagement in the meeting greater productivity in the meeting, and now we actually change our meeting culture, which is going to further drive engagement and productivity throughout the organization. When we begin to really see meetings for what they are and execute on these meetings the way that we should, and again, I'd highly recommend the leader meeting tool that is a part of an Entree Leadership Elite membership. If you were a leader listening or watching this, I'd kick the tires on that. EntreeLeadership.com part of Ramsey Solutions, the mothership that uh, hosts, of course, or, or puts out the Ken Coleman Show. Can't recommend it enough. Coming up, we're going to dive into the best place to work from home and remote work. You were created to fill a unique role in and through your work. Now, some of you may be going, I have no idea what that is. Some of you may be saying, I know what I want to do, but I don't know how to get there. I felt all of those emotions. I've been where you are, and I can tell you, there's hope. That's why I wrote the book, From Paycheck to Purpose. You can make the income you want and the impact that you desire, and I know that you have what it takes. All right, folks, welcome to the Ken Colbert Show, where we help you win at work and at life. You were created to contribute, and if you aren't contributing in a place of work, through a job that you're really good at, doing work you really enjoy, and producing results that you connect to very personally through your values, 
you're not in your sweet spot. You are not working on purpose. And I can tell you this, you maybe make a good money, but you could be making more. And more importantly, you could be experiencing more meaning. That's where I want to help you get. So no matter where you are in this journey, uh, we want to help you out. Uh, here we go. I am a man of the people. I bring you what you need to know in the news. Uh, all right. Uh, so this is fascinating. Working from home, hybrid work. We're going to get into more hybrid work studies in just moments. By the way, buckle up, kids. We are going to cover some very, very interesting info. And quickly. But first, out of the gate. Foxbusiness.com. Best, worst states for working from home in 2022. Wallet Hub uh, published this report. And they looked at several different things. So they're looking for uh, the highest share of population working from home. Okay. Uh, they are looking for states that have lowest costs for things like internet, uh, a lot of cybersecurity in their inter infrastructure, uh, low cost of things like electricity and water. So what they did was they looked at all of these types of uh, factors, if you will, and you compile them, you go, okay, these are the best states. It's more advantageous for somebody to work from home, whether that be hybrid or full-time remote. So here we go. Nathan's going to throw these up on the screen. Uh, the states, the, these are the best. We're going to do the top 10 states. New Jersey, number one. I can't remember New Jersey ever being number one at anything. Oh, wow. Right out of the gate there, taking a shot at Jersey. Going to get some hate mail for that. Uh Speaking of places you don't expect to be number one in anything other than inefficiency and waste and pork and hot air, Washington, D.C., number two, which I want to pause here for a moment, Nathan, before we go to number three. I think there's a pattern here. It's not in the data, but I'm going to make a proposition, a supposition. Best states for working from home, we'll call Washington, D.C., the District of Columbia State. New Jersey and Washington, D.C.? Maybe because nobody actually wants to go in. Mm-hmm. Think about it. All right, next, number three, Delaware. Number four, Connecticut. Number five, Massachusetts. Anybody seen a pattern in our top five? Yes, D.C., the southernmost area, everything above D.C., oh, yeah, it's all north. Northeast, by the way. Now we start to branch out. Number six is Utah. Uh, my guess on Utah is it's just so daggum beautiful. And why would you gonna want to go work in the office when your backyard probably looks like a Bob Ross painting? Number seven, Texas. Well, I, I, you know Texas, you know. Everybody lives on a ranch. I kid. Uh, number eight, Washington State. Number nine, Maryland. And number 10, New York. Okay. Now, how about the worst states? Uh, these are the round out the worst states here. 42, West Virginia. Uh, 43, New Mexico. 44, Hawaii. 45, Wyoming. 46, Oklahoma. 47, Arkansas. 48, North Dakota. 49, Montana. 50, Mississippi, 51, Alaska. So make of that what you will. Those are the 10 states that are the worst for working from home. Uh, I'm not going to break that down too much. Uh, all right. So now, staying in the news, if you will, newsmakers. There's a guy by the name of Adam Grant, very respected uh, psychologist, and he focuses a lot on uh, work psychology, the psychology of workers, and he recently tweeted something. Do we have this, by the way? Okay. For our uh, listening audience, I'll read this to you. For our video audience, you can read along. This is a recent tweet of his, uh, or uh, Instagram post, that looks like. Anyway, he says, working from home two days a week is good for people and organizations. Experiment. 1,600 people, six months, being randomly assigned to three days on site. Obviously, two days working from home. Quitting was down 35%, sick days down 12%. Increased satisfaction, no cost to performance or promotions. And then he makes a statement, the future is hybrid. Right, now I want to point something out because I think Adam Grant is a very smart guy. Um, and I actually think he's right 
that the future is going to be more hybrid based. I, I do think that's true. However, um, he doesn't tell us the study, so I can't look it up and dig in. Um, and and I will tell you that what I don't see here is is it very clear that. These were healthy cultures or unhealthy cultures? I wonder. You know, I wonder if the increased satisfaction was a result of they were not so healthy cultures and two days away from unhealthy people, unhealthy leaders, uh, increase their satisfaction. I wonder. I wonder if maybe they all of these people that responded, the 1,600 people, a large portion, were people that worked in healthy cultures and there was already a remote element in place anyway. There's just a lot here that's not said. So he makes a strong statement. The future is hybrid. I think he's right. However, there are downsides to hybrid. The BBC has an article out entitled, Why Hybrid Work is Emotionally Exhausting. Uh, Tiny Pulse did a study and found that more than 80% of people reported uh, excuse me, 80% of leaders reported that the hybrid model was emotionally exhausting and physically exhausting for workers because they were constantly moving in between uh, the arrangements. You have an in-office arrangement, you got your desk, everything, and then you got your whatever your setup is at home or if you're at a local coffee shop or whatever. And uh, that this was more emotionally taxing than full-time office-based work. So we got two different data points here. And I'm not presenting this as conflicting information for the sake of saying, well, Adam's wrong, these people are right. No, what I'm saying is, is that you got to be careful sometimes in what you extrapolate from data and you don't just take it as is. Okay. So you got one study that showed that a hybrid model showed some very positive effects, but this was over six months, okay? But this data is pretty stunning. There's a quote from a lady who had been working in a um, hybrid model, some in the office, some at home, and she said um, it involves planning, a stop-start routine, taking my laptop to and from the office every day, remembering what important things I've left where. It's the psychological shift, the change of setting every day that's so tiring. It's the constant feeling of never being settled, stressed, and my productive homeworking always being disrupted. So you've got a very personal anecdote here, but it leads to what we're seeing in this one study. So if Adam is right, and I think he is, Leaders are going to have to figure out what are the pain points you as workers in a hybrid model are going to have to figure out what are the pain points. So we take this lady's quote. Let's break it down so that you can get a practical walk away here. What do we do? Well, if you're getting interrupted at home, maybe hybrid working doesn't involve you working at home. Maybe it's a coffee shop where people leave you alone. You put your earbuds in or whatever you call them these days and you listen to music, you do your thing. Okay, I don't know why she's stressed out about bringing her laptop to and from. I take my laptop home every day. So, I mean, she, she might have a little snowflake, snowflakery going on there. Uh, I'd get over that. That's pretty simple. It's unplugged from the dock. Put it in your bag. Take it home. Get it out the next day. I do that. I'm a disaster with details. All right? Here's the point. You're going to have to figure out what the balance is. And when you figure that balance out, then you can move in between formats. Very interesting stuff. All right, coming up, we're going to coach you up. Are you wondering if you should leave your current job or stay put? Well, you're not alone. That's why we created the Should I Quit My Job quiz. In just five minutes or less, this quiz will help you determine if you're at the right company and if you're in the right role. And if you need to make a move, you'll get practical steps to keep you moving forward. Folks, it's time to get unstuck. Life is too short not to do what you were created to do. Go take the quiz right now at kencoleman.com slash quiz.
All right, folks, welcome back to the Ken Coleman Show. Coming up uh, uh, a little bit later, don't forget, um, we're going to get to our fun segment. I really enjoy this. Um, These crazy job titles or unique job titles and what they make uh, in the world of work. I love that. So that's coming up. You don't want to miss that. All right, let's get to uh, the phones. Mason joins us now in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Mason, you're on the Ken Coleman Show. Mr. Coleman, thank you so much for taking time to answer my questions. You bet. What's Um, happening? So um, I've been trying to figure out exactly where I need to be uh, in terms of my career choice. I was finally honest with myself this weekend, and I said, I can't be where I'm at right now. I'm, uh, I don't want to pursue this field anymore. Um, this has probably been about a year and a half coming now. So I'm just kind of lost and trying to figure out, uh, where I actually need to be. And I haven't really thought about it very much to be honest. Oh, so you're coming to me. You think as a blank slate, a virtual clean whiteboard. Yes, sir. Okay. All right. So before I start breaking down how we can come up with some thoughts, you're telling me you've never had an idea of something better than what you're doing now? Not one idea, not one wondering? I've kind of just thought about a couple of different things. Then give me those two things. I, okay. Um, so. Now, now about, let me just tell you something right now. In order for me to help you, I've done this a lot, my man, and I'm honored mm-hmm. and privileged that you've called you're already thinking about how you're going to say it and how it sounds. That's not your job. My job is mm-hmm. to listen to you, ask questions. We're going to pull some stuff out of you. So I don't want you to think about how to say these things anymore. You were about ready to say them, then you went into, well, and that's part of your problem. I want you to just tell mm-hmm. me what these ideas are and let me ask questions. Go. Okay. So I love the idea of helping people. Um, I also like uh, audio technology. I actually have a degree in music technology. Um, but I'm not really using it right now. Um, so is that one idea or is that two helping people was one idea and audio music yeah. tech is another. Yeah, that's, um, I've, I've, I enjoy, um, no, so no, you didn't answer my question. Program. You didn't answer my question. Are those two separate ideas? Uh, yeah, they're pretty much two All separate right, great. ideas. So let's dive into the helping people, which is way too 50,000 foot in the air. Who are the right. people? Who are the people you want to help? What problem or desire do they have? To Def- find that for me. Um, I like to point people in the right direction. Um, I like to listen to them and kind of just um, help give them ideas whenever they whenever they ask for them. Who? And, what um, is the problem that you are giving them direction on? Um. Or what's the desire? Advice. Problem or desire, I want you to define it very specifically. I, I'm, I'm sorry. Can you say that one more time? You said you love giving people problem. advice, but I'm trying to help mm-hmm. you define those people more specifically so that we can figure out what that professional path might look like. Tell me the problem mm-hmm. or desire. Do you understand the difference? Uh, no, sir. I don't, okay. I, if you're I, giving I somebody advice... So I'm mm-hmm. giving you advice right now. What's your problem? Your problem uh, is problem. you don't know what you want to do. So if you're giving mm-hmm. advice to people, what kind of challenges are you giving them advice on? Um, just uh, um, I apologize. I'm nervous right hey, now. Hey, <laughs> listen, Mason. I know I'm putting pressure on you, but this is the answers mm-hmm. are in your head, and I know you're nervous. You're fine. You're doing great. All right. Thanks. I just need you to trust me and I need you to mm-hmm. stop thinking. Don't try to say it fancy. Don't try to give me, you don't have to come up with this. You just have to answer me. You feel me? Mm-hmm. You're doing great. Now tell Thank me you. when you gave somebody advice recently, what was it? What mm-hmm. was the advice? Um, I gave them advice to, um, like I know somebody was trying to look for a way to sell their truck Okay, good. Um, because they they couldn't make the payments, and so I was just like, okay, well, uh, let's let's look over here, maybe uh, find something reliable, like a cheap cheap 
but reliable Toyota or something Fantastic. like that. Fantastic. Okay. So when I say who are the people you want to help, what problem or desire do they have, I'm trying to get at what you get fired up about giving advice on or solving. Do you understand now what I'm mm -hmm. saying? Yes, sir. All right. So let's have fun for a moment. All right. Okay. If I gave you a great paying job tomorrow that you got to try for 30 days, one month, and you mm -hmm. were guaranteed to be successful at it, didn't have to commit to it for the rest of your professional life, and you were in the advice giving, I was paying you to give advice, what would be your favorite types of problems to take on for people? They come to you and they go, I'm having an issue with this, I'm having it. What would they be? If it's two or three that pop in your mind, because as I've been saying this, you're already getting ideas, aren't you? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Then just tell me. Um, life advice and financial advice. Life advice, financial advice. Now we got something, right? Mm -hmm. So yes, what sir. are the type of jobs that would allow you to get paid to give people life advice and financial advice? Mm, probably counseling, mm -hmm. um, something in the, what else? Um, financial advisor? Right, so mm -hmm. you financial could, advisor. Yeah, yeah you could, we have Smart Vester Pros at Ramsey Solutions. These are men and women that give people all kinds of coaching on investment strategies, retirement strategies, saving strategies. Right, so you can think. Mm -hmm. and, and by the way, there's a therapist, but then there is guidance counselor at a school. There is uh, career counselors on college campuses. Uh, you know, there are life coaches. There are so many different types of ways. You now have narrowed this thing down to where you still have several options on this path. So the question becomes, mm -hmm. Mason, tell me from your past or your present, why that kind of work interests you? I like to, I like to see the joy in people's eyes when they see that somebody is a listening to me and B mm -hmm. uh, they are willing to help me with a problem. I love that. Do you have any coaches or counselors or people in your life that did that for you at significant moments of your life? Oh, there's, there's a lot of them. Uh, I know my father is one of them. Mm -hmm. uh, my wife is one right now. Yeah. My wife's my rock star. That's I awesome. can't even begin to say that. And isn't it possible that what has been effective for you and has helped you in so many ways in different moments of your life is now something you go, I want to do that for others? I'm sorry, can you say that one more time? I apologize. <laughs> Is it possible that what has been done for you, you now want to do mm -hmm. for others? Yes. You've been impacted by that, and you want to give it to others, right? Yes, sir. So you're calling me going, I feel stuck and I need to pivot, but I don't know where to go. Your homework assignment is to take my Get Clear Career Assessment. I'm going to give it to you for free, okay? Oh, okay. Thank you. I want you to take it. I want you to look okay. at your – it's going to give you a list – of your top talents, what you do best. It's going to give you a list of your top passions. I define that as work you love. And it's going to show you your primary motivational driver at work, what we call mission. And then it's going to put those answers into a purpose sentence that now is going to become a very high level, but specific mm -hmm. job description. And now you just got to go look and you've already gotten started. You've already given me some ideas on potential professional paths. Now, how confident are you to go forward? To keep I'm exploring. Add a good, add a boy. Now listen, hang on the line, because I'm going to give you the assessment, the get clear career assessment first, and then Amanda, okay. let's also give him a free copy of From Paycheck to Purpose. Think of the book as the guide up the mountain. The assessment's going to help you determine a couple of mountains that'll work for you. Okay, that's how that works. So I want you to do that. And uh, folks, I would I would remind you, we've had thousands and th tens of thousands of people take the get clear career assessment. It is a wonderful way for you to break through the log jam in your head so that you can go, wait a second, I can now see myself properly. Because all of us have been in seasons of our lives where we don't have enough confidence to actually own who we are. And so if you're new to the show, we look at talent. Everybody has talent, things you do well. We look at passion. Everybody has things they love to do. And we look at mission. Everybody is motivated by a key result. And we help you see how when those are in alignment, purpose is clear in multiple areas of our life. There's not just one dream job, there's multiple. Stay with us. More of the Ken Coleman Show coming up.
According to Glassdoor, the average job offer attracts over 250 applicants. So if you've made it to the interview, you've already made a great impression. So now is your time to showcase how you are the best choice for this role. That's why we created How to Win the Interview. This free guide will walk you through the five strategies to help you stand out amongst the competition. With just a little intentionality, you can prepare yourself to win the interview. To get it, go to kencoleman.com slash interview. All right, folks, well, welcome back to the Ken Coleman Show. I want to say hi to a couple groups of people. One, our YouTubers. We've got a very passionate group, a growing group of people that watch the show live every day on YouTube. Most people, of course, watch it later. That's the that's the reality of YouTube. And they're in the chat room here. And uh, so Tony Page, I want to give Tony a shout out. Uh, he said, my goodness, that was an incredible call. Mason's issues have helped me see me more clearly. Good, Tony. That's exciting. I would highly rec recommend that you get the Get Clear Career Assessment. And let's uh, further pour some gasoline on this new fire for you. 844-747-2577 is the free number if you want to get coached up. We also have a group of uh, high school students in the lobby of Ramsey Solutions in our Nashville-based uh, world headquarters. It reminds me that if you'd ever uh, get yourself into the Nashville area, um, yeah, Nathan, turn the camera on them. They're they're doing the the fist pump. Oh, you already did. Oh, oh there it is. Oh, very nice. Thank you, Nathan. I I can't find the mustard in my own refrigerator either. It was right there on the giant monitor. So welcome. Uh, fun to see all the youngsters out there uh, joining us live. So uh, uh, if you'd like to come see the show, we'll come out after and shake hands, take pictures, sign books, um, or if you just want to stare at me like a animal in a zoo. That's fine, too. No problem there. All right, Kyle is up next in Augusta, Georgia. Kyle, you're on the Ken Coleman Show. Hi, sir. How are you doing today? I'm living the dream, Kyle. What are you doing? <laughs> Trying to do the same, sir. Good. Um, so a little bit about it. I found myself in a in a situation where I worked my way up to the, the restaurant business and made it up to becoming a restaurant manager, and right. I, I tried that out. So. That was just something that was kind of comfortable, something I had been doing while I was in college, and I was given the opportunity to move into management. Um, I saw the pay increase on it, and it was a logical thing to do at the time, so I took it. Yeah. Um, getting kind of closer to the end of college now, still working uh, the management job, but kind of becoming more bitter with it, not enjoying it, just kind of feels like something that I'm just doing for the money. Mm -hmm. um, but around the same time, that I got offered this job, I got offered a job with the local police department okay. as a police officer. Nice. That's something that I've always been interested in and wanted to do, uh, but the pay cut was substantial. What's the difference? I was right now I'm bringing about uh, sixty, and then sixty a year where I'm at with the restaurant, and then I would be going down to about forty three for the mm -hmm. first year as a police officer. Okay. Now, what after the first year being a police officer, what would what pay would you be elig eligible to make? See, that's the thing. I'm not too sure as far as how they do the raises um, through uh, the city or anything like that. But mm -hmm. I can estimate it that it you would need just to know. go up just a couple of years. Yeah, you yeah. need. Yeah, you need to know uh, because you have a big decision to make. Right. And I'm going to tell you. I'm so glad you called because this is a big psychological decision. It's really hard. Because the, the natural human element is to go, look, I'm making $60,000 over here managing a restaurant. And if I go become a police officer, which is something I, th I believe I've always wanted to do, I want to make way less. So, this, right. so the natural mindset, the logic kicks in and goes, well, that doesn't make any sense. That's not a good decision, except for the fact that you're miserable being a restaurant manager. And you're not going to hang yeah. out doing that much longer. True or false? Uh, you're, you're true. You okay. hit it right on the head right there. So I'm not, uh, so here's what I'm not going to do. I'm not going to say, well, look, man, if you absolutely know that you want to be a police officer, it's a no brainer. Take the pay cut. I'm not going to say that. That's your decision right. to make. However, in between that decision, my question is what draws you to being a police officer? What, what, what right. pulls your interest and maybe even your heart? Is it that you've always loved protecting people, serving people that maybe need it most? Because I asked the question, what else besides being a police officer 
would allow me to make closer to 60,000 early on or get to 60 and keep growing. So I start thinking, well, maybe the FBI, CIA, private security, military. I start to at least walk through that exercise to go, well, this is similar to being a police officer. And so what we're not doing is we're not locking ourselves into, well, gee whiz, the only way to do what I love is to take a huge pay cut. Now we may find that being a police officer is the thing you want to do. And if that's the case, then that's what you're going to do. You're going to pay your dues. You're going to get in. Or maybe you move to an area where as a police officer, you can make 75,000. We haven't discussed that. If we're going to stay in Augusta, Georgia, well, then we're limiting ourselves. So those are your homework assignments. Look around. Look elsewhere geographically. That'll help you make your decision. This is the Ken College. Do you know what you were born to do? In order to get hired at a job you love, you need to get clear on your talent, passion, and mission. That's why our team created the Career Clarity Guide. In just a few minutes, this free tool will walk you through a process to discover what you do best, talent, the work you love to do, passion, and the results you want your work to produce. That's mission. Then you're going to feel way more confident throughout the job search process. To get started, go now to kencoleman.com slash clarity. Coming up in just a moment, unique and crazy job titles and what they pay. <laughs> we got a couple of interesting ones today. We always do. That's coming up in just a moment. Uh, but first, if you are in the job search right now, and millions are, the great resignation continues to steamroll on. Uh, the job search can be long and lonely. Countless attempts to get noticed. You're getting ghosted. It feels frustrating. You feel like a loser because you're not getting any bites. You need to be engaging with my friends at ZipRecruiter, the number one job site in the United States. Their artificial intelligence makes you so effective. In one click, you get a profile, attach the resume. They send you jobs that they think you're fit for. You decide one click, yep, I'm applying. They get you up to date on what's going on. You're not being ghosted. And remember, they're always recruiting on your behalf, even while you're doing your life. ZipRecruiter.com, it's free to you. It doesn't cost you anything. ZipRecruiter.com. Uh, all right, let's get back to the phones. And then don't forget, uh, hilarious job titles and what they actually pay. Sarah is in Ogden, Utah. Sarah, you're on the Ken Coleman Show. Hi, Ken. Thank you for taking my call today. You bet. What's up, Sarah? So I've been a stay-at-home mom for the past 17 years. My youngest is in third grade, and I have loved being home. Yay! Um, yeah. About two years ago, I got my degree in elementary education, and since then, I have just been substitute teaching. Okay. Um, recently, I've been feeling the draw to take a part-time teaching position, but I'm really having a hard time um, giving up the freedom and flexibility that being stay, um, being a stay-at-home mom and subbing gives me. But I do feel this draw to go into the workforce. And so I'm just trying to, I'm not sure what to do um, about these anxious feelings that I'm having. Maybe it means it's not the right decision okay. for me. Oh, but I do okay, whoa, 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 okay, good. What are you anxious about? I want you to be very specific. There's no shame, by the way, in having anxious feelings. It's a form of fear that's very natural. So I don't want you to be ashamed. But I want you okay. to specifically tell me what you're most anxious about as it relates to returning to a part-time job. Um, giving up the freedom and flexibility that I've had. Well, let me ask you this. If it's a part-time job, doesn't that give you a decent amount of freedom and flexibility just by the nature of it being part-time? Um, it does. The job I'm looking at is uh, four hours every day, so I do lose a quite a bit of time in the mornings. Um, it kind of only gives me about two hours in the afternoon before my kids come home, and I have to drive them around and take them places. Okay. All right, so what else are you anxious about? Besides losing some freedom and some flexibility? Um, a little anxious about still being able to um, complete all the things I feel like needs to be done and still having uh, freedom to take care of my parents if they need help, um, serve others. Are you a person uh, that finds yourself, or uh, have you in the past found yourself working beyond the required work hours? 
taking on more maybe than is required? Um, not for pay, <laughs> but for service and fun, yes. Okay, but see, that what's rooted in that anxiety there is if I go work a part-time job, I'm not going to be able to do the other things. And that may be tied to the first one. Maybe you just gave me two versions of the first fear, which is I'm going to lose some freedom and flexibility. Uh, if I'm working for somebody four hours a day and something happens to my parents, I'm not going to be able to do that. So it feels like that's yeah. the, the central theme. So yeah. you have to weigh this. I think this is actually pretty simple. If that is that it? Is that pretty much your big anxiety on this? Yes. Okay, listen. Yeah. You got to decide what do you want more. This is simple. You got you're a mom. You've been a mom for 17 years. If your kids come to you and say, "Mom, I got two options." You're going to walk your kids through a pros and cons type conversation, yes or no? Yes. And at the end of the day, you're going to go, "Well, sweetheart, which one do you want to do more? If we've determined that there's good in both and you get to choose, do you want to work part-time more than you want to have that four-hour block of freedom and flexibility every day? That's what this comes down to. What if I can't make that decision because I've done the pros and cons? And That's not true. I, I, I would tell you you can make the decision. You're a grown woman who's raised kids. You're quite yeah. responsible, and you're quite capable of making a decision. I'd say put your big girl pants on is what I'd say. <laughs> <laughs> make the decision. Okay. Don't tell me you can't make the decision. Well, I can. I've just played out both scenarios in my head. I, I've made the decision and then... All right, so will you call me today... For like you, a while. Yeah, but which one are you leaning towards? And don't tell me you're 50-50 because you're not. I'm kind of leaning towards going back to the workforce. Then go back to work. Okay. I just became her temporary husband. It didn't cost her anything. There's no commitment necessary. That's what I would do with my wife, Stacy, right there. Run it through your mind and heart, babe. Pros and cons. Which way are you leaning? Go that way. Because here's the good news, Sarah. Listen, Sarah, if you go to the part-time job and you realize, ah, it was the wrong direction, guess what? Hasta la vista, baby. Deuces. I'm out. You can quit. This is not a life-changing decision. All right. I got I to gotta shift gears here. Thank you for the call, Sarah. There's no pressure on this decision. Make the decision you're leaning towards. If you change your mind, it's America. You're going to be fine. All right. Uh, so we have some photos uh, for our viewing audience that you'll be able to see. I'll describe them for our listening audience. Uh, th this is our uh, fun little segment where I, I attempt to show you, because I'm a man of the people, so I want to show you people that there are so many different ways to make a living and enjoy it and make the money you need. And so we illustrate it by these really unique job titles, and we tell you what they make. Here's the first one. Job title is bed warmer. <laughs> Hey, listen, nothing has topped the armpit sniffer. Uh, that, to me, is still an all-time number one because we got some high school boys out here watching the show. And uh, if you've got a great smeller, great sniffer, this is a real job testing deodorants and things of that nature. Oh, they're pointing out one guy right here, that, and he, and he leaned it. The guy with the mullet, by the way. You, 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 you know, the guys with the mullet are always unique, and I like that. By the way, sir, that's a fabulous mullet. It's fantastic. There he is. Look at that young man, right? Turn around for our viewing audience. Turn around and show him that mullet. Look at that thing. Oh, man. Now, is that natural curl or did you use perm? Okay, good. Very good. Because I was going to ask for your man card if there was uh, if there was any chemicals in there helping that. Fantastic. All right, so what does a bed warmer do? This is real, by the way. Professional bed warmers are paid to lay in a person's bed for at least one hour. <laughs> to warm the bed up for them to sleep in. Workers are restricted from any physical contact by their clients and are equipped with a panic button. You ready for this? $87 a night or $1,800 a month. Now, can I just tell you something about this? This is a sign of the apocalypse. The world is coming to an end soon because we have so much wealth in this world that somebody has got so much disposable income that they're going to pay somebody nearly $90 a night to come lay in their bed. That's creepy, not to mention just wasteful. But if you can get money laying in somebody's bed for an hour, you talk about low stress. 
until they're a creeper. By the way, if you take a job where you were given a panic button as a part of the deal, you should probably rethink that job. I know. Job title, matchmaker. Online dating sites now provide most matchmaking services, but many relationship seekers still prefer to get assistance from an in-person. So think of this like your real estate agent for your love life. Matchmakers still exist, uh, and they help clients in, uh, very personally uh, on this. So uh, they make about $60,000 a year. And then fake corporate executive. Are you kidding me? This is real? Fake corporate executive. It sounds like a joke, but some Chinese companies have been known to hire Caucasian men to pose as Western business leaders. It's great if you have some real business experience, but mostly you just need to look the part and attend a few dinners, tour a factory, or go to one or more ceremonies to get your picture taken with local Chinese leaders. It's all intended to make your temporary employer look like a credible, globally connected company. So if you are a white Caucasian male and you like to act and you look good in a suit, head on over to China because you can make $1,000 a week acting like a real executive. Again, a sign of the apocalypse. But I got no judgment because if it's ethical and it's honorable, and is that ethical or honorable? Kind of, as long as you don't tell somebody you're an executive. I don't know. It feels a little squishy and ugly to me. I don't like it. Oh, fun stuff. Hey, I got to get out of here. Remember this. You matter. You have what it takes. This is the Ken Coleman Show. Press on. Thanks for listening to The Ken Coleman Show. For more, you can find the show on demand wherever you listen to podcasts and watch the show on YouTube. You can also find Ken across all social media by following at Ken Coleman.